Okay, so I am not Perini Sunderlingam. I am Jane Hirschfield sitting in for Perini. Um, Perini uh, emailed at 2.30 this afternoon that she had violent food poisoning. And so I went to, there was an essay she had written in an introduction to a special science and literature issue of World Literature Today. And it was because of things she'd said in there that I had asked her and suggested that she be on this program. So I basically went back to her essay and what I'm doing is telling you what she would have, I guess, told you. Um, I hope you can tell from those first two uh, talks which we heard why I am so excited about being the poet in residence, the artist in residence with this program. You know, a pianist does not know how to build a piano, but they are passionately engaged with its working and know the debt that is owed to the person who harvests the tree and tunes the strings and assembles it all into the whole. And what learning about these brain structures and systems has given me is just a deep, deep appreciation for um, how far down the piano mechanisms go and, and not only how fragile they are, but how in fact what a great deal of poems sometimes do is duplicate um, uh, what might look like illness in another context. <laughs> you know, we are often mixing up the normal. Anyhow, now this is uh, three areas of brain research that I think Perini was going to talk about, uh, which fall in her description under the relatively new field of neuroaesthetics. Um, some of the most interesting of this research is being done at UC San Diego by um, a researcher, V.S. Ramachandran. And this is a very small uh, bit of what he has worked on. He's worked on a great many things. But one of them is uh, metaphor making and the brain. And for any of you who are here from the science team and not the poetry team, uh, which we now know are one joined and inextricable from here on out, um, a metaphor, if that is uh, a term you're not familiar with, is basically describing one thing in terms of another. One of the most famous is Carl Sandburg saying, the fog comes in on little cat's feet. Uh, that's a metaphor. And what Ramachandran is proposing is that certain you know, as we all know, all of us who've written poems or taught poetry workshops or participated in poetry workshops, some metaphors work better than others. Uh, sometimes they come off, sometimes they don't. You can't just, you can try taking two random things and putting them together and seeing if it's gonna make a metaphor, and sometimes it does, and sometimes you go, oh, not that one, and you look for another. He is offering a hypothesis about why. And what he suggests is that it has to do with proximate areas, structures of the brain, which I can't possibly tell you the names of. Um, but for instance, uh, taste goes well with touch. And so it's very common to say something like describe a cheddar cheese as a sharp cheddar. We have no problem with that. But he says that sound is further would take a longer neural leap physiologically to get to sound from taste. And so we don't usually talk about loud cheeses. Although I can certainly imagine a poet or a food critic talking about a strident blue. Um, so, you know, this is where I say poets deliberately, you know, we try to do the acrobatic wrong thing and sometimes it comes off. Um, vision and sound are felicitous couplings, therefore um, taking him at his word, Perini at her word, and hoping nobody up here is going to tell me I'm wrong. Those areas should be closer together in, in the brain. Um, don't have a poet do neuroscience. Um, so, so that makes for felicitous couplings, and we say things like, um, the print of that dress is loud. Um, uh, almost throughout the world, so far as I know, if you put red and a loud, s a loud sound together, everybody understands this as danger, warning, caution. And what he is saying is that this is structurally easy to get and it's why it works. Um, uh, the insular cortex area, quoting directly from Perini's essay now, that processes taste is relatively near the part of the brain that processes touch. 
Um, and so he thinks that people who are good at making metaphors, especially perhaps the m less usual metaphors, because anybody can make a cliche, have hyperconnective brains. Uh, more things join to more things. Um, and I'm very curious, this is a question for the last part of the discussion, if anybody, including me, remembers it. You know, we, we know that synesthesia occurs in people where they cross, say, you know, the number four they're quite sure is a vivid green. Um, or a certain sound will always have the shape of a cone or a funnel or, or a wheel or whatever. And I'm really curious about how that ties into this proximate thing. So that's me, not Perini. Uh, the second thing she had talked about was George Lakoff's research about all abstract language being secondary in our evolutionary development as thinking beings, and that metaphor comes first because metaphor draws from our physical knowledge of the world. And so throughout the world, there are certain biases, such as up is good. Well, if you depend on a plant growing or being upright rather than dead on the ground, up is good. Um, this transfers to other systems. So for example, we call a moral person a person of good character. Um, that is the sketchiest possible introduction to, to George Lakoff's work. Um, his book, done with Mark Johnson, Metaphors We Live By, is a short, easy to read, paradigm changing book. I read it years ago and everything looked different after I did. I completely recommend it. Um, he also talks, since we were talking about, uh, Virginia was mentioning facial response in her presentation, one of the things in his, in his book is describing that when we express moral disgust, our faces make the face of tasting gone bad food. Um, so we are very creaturely beings, and poetry, of course, always draws from this. Um, the third area of cognitive research that, that she had talked about in this essay was something called priming. And I've been reading about these descriptions of priming experiments uh, for a long time, too. What it says is that if you expose people to either certain physical sensations or certain concepts that both works, both the physical thing or simply the words for it, um, even though they don't know, um, they will be affected by what has been near their awareness. So one example that she talks about is at Yale, a researcher named John Barr um, did a study where uh, the participants were asked to say whether a stranger they were talking to was a warm person or a cold person. If you had the participant, if you happened to give them a warm teacup to hold, you gave them a cup of tea and no table to put it down on, they would regularly describe the person as warmer. And presumably the opposite. If you gave them a chilled lemonade, the person would be cold. So on that first date, that first blind date, um, go, go for coffee, not for lemonade. Um, and another, another experiment, which I remember, but I can't tell you who did, was, a, was a, um, an experiment where people were brought into a room and um, just talked to for a while or read to, and some of them were, were talked to or read to with words like um, gray-haired, shuffleboard, canasta, and others were read to and talked to with more neutral things. And then the actual experiment was timing them when they walked out the door of the room to the elevator. And the people who had been exposed to um, canasta walked much more slowly than the people who had been playing tennis in their, in their exposure to language. Um, this is a big question for me because I do really wonder, since we are continually exposed to almost everything, it made me wonder, am I just a pinball in this world? You know, am I, uh, could, could it possibly work? Because, you know, in, in any paragraph, you could be exposed to canasta 
and a springing kangaroo. And when you leave the room, how fast or slow do you walk? So this is a question again for, for later, perhaps. But when I think about it from a poet's perspective, everything clicks into place for me. Because of course, in a poem, um, every word is casting a kind of color and shadow over the entire experience of the entire poem. It is exactly how we want it to work. Um, so do the advertisers want it to work that way, but never, never mind. Um, rhetoric is rhetoric, whatever field it's in. Um, but I do think that, that you know, what, what is important about this priming idea is that it really does affect how we read poetry, except we are not stupid about it. You know, that's the difference. These experiments describe a kind of auto-response, whereas in poetry what you want is to be more and more sensitive to the effect of every word. I mean, I've written poems about and, or, to, if, um, you know, each of these words is a recalibration of your being in the world, and they are meant to prime you, but they are meant to prime you towards a deeper particularity of expression and not towards um, stubbornness or, or, or dumb linking. Um, so, so the signals of specificity, the signals of connection, the physicality of world, word, expression, comprehension. This is, this is all what I think Perini was going to cover. Um, thank you. <laughs>